Well, welcome everybody to episode one of Bathica Banter. So glad to uh, be starting a new year and a new program, a new show with a new title. And um, with that, a wonderful guest as our first guest uh, in 2024. Uh, he is uh, the executive director for Climate Care Canada, and that is, I'm happy to say, my good friend, Victor Hyman. Victor, say hello to everybody. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Jerry. And I'm so excited to be on episode one of Bathica Banner. That is quite the <laughs> honor. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Wouldn't have it any other way that you be our first guest, uh, Victor. Well, Victor, I always like to start with the start. And what I mean by that is uh, I like to ask our guest, what got you to this point in your HVAC career? So if you would be so kind to share with our audience your HVAC journey, if you will. Absolutely. So I, I totally fell into HVAC. Um, that's what we call it in Canada. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, I was working in a completely unrelated field um, back in the early 2000s. Um, I actually uh, got a patent for a musical notation, colorized music notation system. And uh, I was working for a fellow um, who uh, had some dreams of uh, doing some interesting things. Fortunately, we ran out of money and um, I was looking for something else to do. Um, and I had I developed a couple of business, new business ideas and a friend introduced me to two brothers who owned a residential light commercial HVAC business. Um, and they were really, I think, very successful at growing that business, but challenged with how to put in place systems and procedures to allow it to continue to grow. And uh, so I was introduced to them. I came on board and uh, basically taking it. I can't call it a mom and pop shop because it was two brothers, but Jack and Joe and helping them, um, you know, professionalize that business and take it to the next level. I did that for five years. Um, and then after that, my brother, uh, or while I was doing that, my brother started a great business uh, recycling waste cooking oil. Um, and he said, why don't I need help too. Why don't you come and work with me? I should have known better having worked for two <laughs> brothers that that was going to be a challenge. So yeah. we, I, I did that with him for a year. Um, he's grown that business fantastically without my help. Um, but I said, you know what, I'm, I think, you know, uh, FIFO here, first in, or FILO, first in, last out. I'm the last one, and I'm going to be the first one out of this. And I got back into HVAC. I was really lucky to uh, end up at EMCO uh, in the yeah. supply. And I was there for almost nine years. It was a great, a great experience. Um, along the way, I was involved with Climate Care because uh, the company that I had joined back in 2005 uh, became a Climate Care member while I was there. And um, and then when I went to work for Emco, MQ Supply, I became the Climate Care Champion uh, inside Emco, and that became our second biggest HVAC account in in Ontario. It was a great opportunity, great business. When I left Emco, uh, uh, Climate Care was looking for a new executive director. Their first executive director had retired, and I said, you know what, this is the kind of organization I'd really like to work for. So that's that's my story in a nutshell. Fantastic. That's yeah, quite a journey and, and a lot of different uh, turns and detours uh, along the way, as, as, as I think is true for most of us, is it not? I don't think anybody wakes up one morning and says, I'm going into HVAC. Or very, know, very few do. I joke, Jerry, you know, there's there's three ways into this business I've learned into HVAC. Uh, you yeah. can be born into it. Um, yeah. One of my members, uh, Rob Lake, he says, you know, you can be born with a flashlight in your hand. Um, yeah. And, you know, at a young age, you, you know, working there with a the trouble light and dad telling, no, not that way, point it over here. It's in my eyes. Yeah, yeah. So you can be born with a flashlight in your hand. And that's a good number of our members are second or third generation, uh, you know, HVAC contractors. Yeah. Um, and the second way into the business is you can fall into it. You can know a guy, you know, right. I knew a guy and he was in HVAC and he said, come on and do this with me. Um, and then many of those people at some point, they think their bosses were, are idiots. I mean, just to be frank. And they yeah. can do it better. And then they go yeah. off and do it better. And they realize, you know what? Maybe he wasn't quite as dumb as I thought he was. <laughs> right. And the third way into HVAC, I, so I, I tell this to my members, uh, you know, or I, when I had this realization that there were really only two ways into HVAC, I shared this with my members. And one of my members said, no, 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 there's a third way. Your spouse, your husband can lie to you and say, come work with me. This will be fun. <laughs> and lo and behold, every female climate care owner, that is, that is what happened. Uh, yeah, they want to work with their husbands. 
Well, I, I, I think I fall into a couple of those categories, quite <laughs> frankly, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. But Victor, I, I want to go right into the reason why I wanted you as our first guest on Bathica Banter in the new year, and that is your involvement with Climate Care Canada. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in this concept of an HVAC contractor cooperative, and I, I would love for you to describe for our, our audience how that benefits, number one, your, your member, your contractor member, and also how it benefits the end user, the homeowner. So please. Yeah, so thank you. Co-ops are not something most people think of. I mean, no. when, we, when we, and when we do think of a co-op, we, thought, we think maybe of a housing cooperative um, or a credit union. Um, yeah. So a retail co-op is really pretty unusual. And what happened was um, back in 1992, um, six contractors got together and said, you know, we really need to work together to put in place, like I said, you know, systems and procedures, but also work better at buying and marketing and training um, and get some peer support. And that became Climate Care. Uh, and, and what's unique about Climate Care is, aside from the fact of you know, our corporate structure as a, as a cooperative, our members are the owners. So for those who aren't familiar with the co-op concept, I kind of liken it to a franchise where mm -hmm. the franchisees are the franchisor. They own the franchisor. Um, so it's not like I sit in an office and make the decisions um, and, and reap the rewards of those decisions. Hmm. We are members first. Everything we do, we do for our members. They own the cooperative as a whole. So the benefit to the to the individual contractor is, you know, we we can take um, many small mid sized contractors and put them together and boost their buying power. I think that's the most obvious thing, and that's how we started as a buying group. Hmm. Um, we can do marketing on a scale that individual contractors can't do. We can produce collateral that they can then share. Um, and we can boost their local marketing efforts. Uh, the training and the peer support is fundamental. And that's for many years been on sales training and technical training. And more and more, we're talking about leadership and management training. And, and then the peer support. And this is really the, the, probably the most important pillar um, is having peers that have been through the same thing. While they were born with the flashlight in their hand, or they mm -hmm. fell into it, or their, their husband said, come, this will be fun. Uh, they have, you know, a, dozens of other members that they can rely on and reach out to. And just this morning on our SAM email, there was a question that came out. Um, we have an email, internal email that's uh, support, advise, and mentor. And members can ask each other for help on any topic and reach out. So that's the big thing. For, for, our, for our consumers, the advantage of dealing with a co-op is, uh, the individual autonomy that our members have um, in making the decisions that are best for their market and for their customers and their communities and their uh, their employees, they have that local autonomy, uh, but, or and, they get the benefit of a much bigger organization, right? We are one of the largest, as a group, we're one of the four largest HVAC contractors in Ontario, um, in certainly in the um, service retrofit maintenance space. And we're able to uh, provide homeowners with access to product um, and pricing and, um, and the backing of a much larger organization. You know, Victor, a couple of things jump out at me. And, and the first is the uh, buying power issue. You know, I've known uh, in, in my career in HVAC, a, a, a few distributors that have embraced that uh, business model, namely Johnstone Supply, people like Winair, uh, they are very much a distributor cooperative, if you will. But I've never seen this on a contractor level. I, I'm fascinated by that concept. So uh, my question is this, are you guys the first to bring this to the contractor level as far as uh, a cooperative is concerned? I, I think we are. I, I mean, I, I like to say that we're Canada's largest HVAC contractor cooperative. Um, yeah. but I think we may be the largest because we may be the only one. Um, I've <laughs> yeah. looked around. I don't see any others. Um, so, you know, there are buying groups. Many industries have buying groups. Um, in, right. On the HVAC side, it does seem to be uh, mostly on the, as you said, on the wholesale distribution side. Right. Um, 
you know, I think that there's been a lot of private equity roll-ups, uh, as you know, across North America, and those organizations certainly try to, you know, flex um, as they gain scale and um, and have strong buying power. But for independent contractors, where they're independently owned, independently operated, um, I think we are unique in that space. Yeah, very interesting. So, uh, Victor, my background was 23 years a contractor in New York and New Jersey. And again, uh, I convinced my wife this would be fun. So it was Patricia and I uh, that, that were the business for, for those 23 years. But um, when we were still contracting, there was something in the States that was then called Contractor 2000. I do believe they are now called uh, Nexstar. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were uh, a network of installers that the contractor would literally buy into the contractor 2000 program. And when I say buy in, I mean just that there, there was a, a fee, an annual fee that as I recall was quite substantial. Um, and it, it gave their members, uh, from my memory, uh, a, a mentoring network, which I thought was so, so valuable is con uh, Climate Care Canada like that? And if not, what's the differences? Sure. So Nexstar still exists. Um, and um, some of our members are actually members of Nexstar because they okay. see a complementary benefit. Um, the, the, I think the, the big difference is the geography. Um, the first big difference is the geography. And when, when I talk to our our members that are in Nexstar, which is a great organization, I have nothing but uh, nice mm. things to say about them. Um, there's a strong American focus. And right. so what Climate Care brings to it is we're very much a Canadian focused organization um, and there's nuances there. So I think that that's, that's number one. Number two is, you know, we get together in, in Ontario uh, four times a year. Um, so training uh, on the geography side, again, you know, that training that we do in person uh, those get togethers that we do, they're easy for our members to get to. So I think that's the the, the big difference. Um, in terms of the cost, I, I don't know what, what their cost structure is. We do have a monthly fee to be a member of Climate Care. Uh, part of that goes to pay for those quarterly meetings that we have. Sure. But we guarantee our members that they will that the the features and benefits, both financial and non-financial, that they get from Climate Care will exceed their membership dues and um, the ROI on climate care membership in cash terms for, for our average member is multiple times uh, what they're paying in dues. So they get back through, through rebates and, and direct savings uh, many times what they're paying in membership. Well, that makes it sound like a no brainer to me. To you say. know, I struggle. I'll tell you, Jerry, it's <laughs> funny. I struggle with this because when I take it out, when I, when I take our program out to yeah. prospects, um, you know, I often get asked, okay, what's, the, what's the catch? You know, yeah. what's the, like, how, how can you do this? How it's can I pay? To true. <laughs> how, it's too good to be true. You're telling me I'll pay, you know, you know, it's $850 Canadian a month plus HST. I'll pay 850 yeah. a month. And you're telling me I'm going to get, you know, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 in benefit back as, I mean, our, our strongest supporting member will get back in 2023 about $130,000. Um, in, in direct cash benefit. And I said, listen, the catch is you got to follow the program, right? Right. Buy from our approved vendors. You got to pay on time. And that's, you know, sure. you know what? one question you didn't ask is what is the benefit that the wholesalers, distributors, manufacturers get? Um, our members pay on time. Uh, that's Brilliant. part of, Brilliant. That's, that's one of the requirements is that they must meet the payment. And so, you know, having been in wholesale, you know, that that doesn't always happen. No. Um, and we have a pretty good rate of our members uh, paying their debts and paying on time. You know, Victor, it brings up another uh, issue. And that is, I, in my experience and in, in my own personal experience with contracting, I've often found that either you're a great mechanic or a great business person. And very difficult to be both, right? <laughs> so having that uh, ability to have a mentors to help you on the business side, to me, uh, uh, absolutely brilliant. One thing I want to go back to with, with Nexstar, with Contractor 2000, if I may. Another thing in my memory is I, I, I remember that 
when a contractor bought into the program, they essentially bought a geographic area. They were guaranteed that they were not going to have an excessive amount of other Contractor 2000 members in that same geographic area. Do, do you offer the same sort of protection or is it something different? Yeah, it's, we're not, it's not wide open, but we, we do not have uh, protected geographies, um, okay. you know, and this is, a, you know, this does come up from time to time. And we have, um, it's, it, we have very few cases where we have members that are like really, really in the same training um, area. We have a couple, right. but it's, I, and I like to say from my own experience back when I was a climate care member myself, that I would rather compete against another climate care member Not fair, than, yeah. than compete against, you know, every other trunk slammer. Right. Yeah. So yeah. the benefit I think of having multiple climate care members in the same geography where that does happen is that if, if one of them is losing, you know, loses a job to another, they know that they didn't lose it on, um, you know, inconsequential things, you know, right. everybody's being held to a high standard and, and doing the right thing. Um, and I think it breeds better competition, better friendly competition. Um, so it does happen from time to time. But the other thing is our, our, our business model is different, Jerry. We're not interested in being box movers. Um, we're interested in really developing deep relationships with our customers. Right. Um, the heart of our business is our We Care program and monthly, uh, monthly pay maintenance. So, you know, we have a club membership. Um, consumers, you know, homeowners pay us a monthly fee to get priority service and um and a number of other benefits plus an annual maintenance and that's the kind of relationship we want to have with the customer not i need a two-time air conditioner how much is it right and so right. that's why i'm not i don't think it really comes up as an issue customers we have are are lifelong customers ideally perfect yeah Victor, I'm curious uh, about another aspect of it, uh, and I do believe I saw this on the Climate Care Canada website. So your members keep their identity, do they not? Uh, if they're Acme Plumbing and Heating, they remain Acme Plumbing and Heating, but can market themselves as a member. Is that the thought process? Yeah, so you can imagine, I think, having been a contractor and you know so many contractors, Jerry, that um, branding and identity is something that contractors really um, invest a lot in, in their, and yeah. especially um, it's the business is an extension of themselves, right? So sure. back in 20, I want to say 2010, 2012, there was a big push in climate care to get everybody branded the same. Um, and it was very contentious, um, but we did it and we did it for 10 years. Um, and in order to be a climate care member, you had to brand as climate care. You had to be, you know, go from Jerry's air to Jerry's air climate care. Gotcha. And, um, you had to adopt all of our truck livery and our uniforms and all that kind of thing. And, um, it was an impediment to growing the co-op. Um, mm. I, you know, many people who I thought would be good climate care members said, well, we're just not interested in rebranding or we just rebranded. We're not going to do it again. Right. Um, and so our board made a decision, a strategic decision, um, just around the same time that I came on board in 2020 to create a second level of membership, which we call enterprise. And enterprise is not branded climate care. So they can add, affix a badge um, and we want them to, to say that they're a proud member of climate care, but sure. they cannot rebrand their business as climate care. Um, so we have, for example, Brooks Heating, and AIR in, um, in Georgetown, Ontario, became a climate care member. And if you go on their website, you'll see it says they're a proud uh, member of the co-op, um, but they've retained their own branding and identity. Should they decide to change that in the future, they have the opportunity to do that. We're a, because we're a co-op and we have a board, and we have a membership committee, that would be something they'd have to apply for. Um, and we wanna grow more strategic members also, more members that are branded climate care. But we don't want the branding to be an impediment to helping contractors um, achieve their gotcha. goals in their business. No, I think that makes a lot of sense, Victor. Cool. Well, Victor, going back to this mentoring concept of uh, Climate Care Canada, um, to me, from the outside looking in, and I think from a unique perspective of me being at one time a contractor, I, I think the mentoring element 
is where your cooperative has the greatest value, at least my perception of it. Um, I, I have a buddy, and, and maybe it's because of this personal experience. I have a buddy who is, uh, he owns a couple of um, music academies, uh, music schools in, in New York. And he got involved in a similar uh, network of, of other uh, owners, music school owners, and it changed his business. And, and I dare say it changed his life all for the better. It was absolutely amazing for me from the outside looking in, witnessing how this fella, how it affected his personal life, how it affected his business. And it was all as a result of this wonderful mentoring that he got from this, uh, this industry cooperative network. So, uh, my question to you, a long way to get to the question, Victor, is how does that work within climate care? What What is that mentoring element like and, and how does it function and how does it, how does it work within climate care? I, I agree with you, Jerry. I think that the peer support is the most valuable thing that we bring um, because you can, you can negotiate like hell and get good pricing from wholesalers. You can you know, hire a marketing company to do marketing for you. Um, but the peer support, the actual coming together and having your they, uh, friends, like these people, yeah. they vacation together, they hang out together yeah. in time, um, and they and they come together four times a year at our, at our general meetings. Um, and so what's amazing to me is to see the, to see it in action, right? So you know, standing at the bar in the evening between the two days of our meetings, um, we have a hospitality, we have dinner, everybody gets together for dinner and drinks. Um, and seeing the support that they get from each other. So I'll give you an example. We have a, a, a member, Rick Buffum, RB Climate Care in Kempville. And Rick's been in business for over 20 years. Uh, he's been a climate care member for over 10 years. And he really struggled with... Um, maintenance plans. Um, mm. And one of the, I think that's probably the biggest challenge we have as an industry is selling maintenance plans effectively um, and getting them on a monthly pay. And that's yeah. because it is such a cash flow driver, it changes your business entirely. When So the first step is to have plans at all, right? Yeah. And the second step is to have those be monthly pay plans that you're billing those credit cards every month. It just totally changes the, the, the business entirely, changes yeah. lives. It saved many of our businesses during COVID. Um, and so Rick was sharing, you know, during the hospitality with some other members that he's really struggling getting from annual pay plans to monthly pay plans. The people in his office are telling him they're going to lose all kinds of customers if he does it. And he doesn't know what to do. And I love when he tells this story because Rick's a he's he's a bit of an imposing guy, you know. He's he's a broad-shouldered guy, and and he <laughs> says it like it is. Like this is his saying, as a matter of fact. One day he said, "I I made mugs." For, Rick's on our board, and one day he said, "I'm in a get it f and done mood." So I said, <laughs> I'm gonna make that into Beautiful. a mug. Beautiful. So Rick's a guy; he gets it done. But he said, "I'm really struggling with this." So. He's standing at the bar and I said, so what happened, Rick? Like I wasn't there at the time. He told me the story. He said, four guys poked me in the chest and said, I did it. You can do it too. It will change your business. Yeah. You just go back to your office on Monday and tell them we're moving to monthly pay. And, and that's really a lot of what the peer support is. It's as simple as that. It's others who have gone through the challenge saying, we're going to support you. You can do this. You pick up the phone on Monday. If they give you a problem back at the office, call me and we'll talk you through it. We'll coach you. So that's yeah. that's a lot of what that is. And and we really try at, at Climate Care Head Office to reinforce that. So at our general meetings, you know, we, we have peer support sessions. We do, we've do we adopted traction and, and the EO, principles of EOS. Um, if you're not familiar with that book, I'd really recommend it. Gino Wickman's book, Traction which came from one of our members, one of our members, uh, George Basormany, uh, who's the, our training committee chair. He recommended that book. And we have a session at our, at our meetings where we identify, discuss, and solve the biggest problem. So before the meetings, we ask our members, okay, what are the issues that you're dealing with? And then they get together 
in table groups and they work on solving those problems and they do it as group as as peers. It's fantastic. Yeah, it, it almost sounds like a, a group um, health <laughs> type of situation, you know, which, which is fantastic. I, I'm, I'm going to make this super personal, Victor, if you'll allow me for a couple of minutes. You know, going back to my days as a contractor uh, with Patricia and I, um, we were small. We were the definition of mom and pop. It was mom and pop, Patricia and I, a couple of trucks. Uh, we would hire labor on an as needed basis. And that really wasn't my plan. Uh, it, it wasn't what I wanted. I had ideas of grandeur, like I think most of us do when we go into our own businesses, but I was the problem. And, and certainly looking back on it, uh, in 2020, I, I can recognize that now, but to be honest with you, I think I recognize it even in the moment. And, and where I'm going with this was my problem was labor. I, I, I didn't trust anybody to do the job the way I would want it done, the, the way that I would personally do it. And on the other side of that, if I did, I didn't trust or I didn't want to train that person to ultimately have them leave and go to one of my competitors or worse yet, become one of my competitors, right? Because that is a scenario which is quite typical in, in our industry. So my question to you is this, and I'm going to use you as my psychiatrist in this situation. I'm going to test, I guess, your, your, your uh, ability with, with climate care to help me mentor through this. How would you address that with one of your members? If one of your members came to you with, with a similar situation of, of, of a stunting of growth? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, the first question would be, what's the alternative? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I know what the alternative was, and that was to stay the same, right? Exactly. So, so yeah. I think that that's yeah. really, you know, the, the first issue really we have to overcome is, are you satisfied with the way things are or yeah. do you want them to be different? And if yeah. you're satisfied with the way things are, then you can continue doing that. If you've hit the ceiling and you, you want to break through it, you want to have more fun and make more money. That's my, my catchphrase, Jerry. You know, our goal is to help residential HVAC contractors have more fun and make more money. And I know having been in the shoes of an HVAC contractor that there are many days you do not have any fun and there are many days you don't make any money. And so the real question is, are you willing to invest to make the change? You know, it, it is very much like therapy to your point. And I joke, yeah. we have a weekly, we have a weekly call for owners and I, it's called our wildly important goals call. And I, and it actually, it's happening at, it's happening at 11 today. And I joke that it's basically a group therapy session. Um, yeah. So my first question to them would be, are you satisfied with the way things are? Do you want to make a change? And if you want to make a change, I don't disagree. You're going to, you know, there are areas where if you don't take certain actions, you're going to have to make compromises. And quality is not one area we should compromise on. So you're going to have to train your people, right? And you're going to run the risk that if you train your people, they may leave. Yeah. But you run a bigger risk if you don't train your people and they stay. Right. <laughs> right. Perfect. Right? Yeah. So I, I yeah. think that's, the, you know, really we've got, to, as you said it, the biggest challenge we have is usually we impose it on ourselves. It's a mental challenge. We've got to break through that. And it's really about just, you know, a guided discovery. What are the alternatives? What happens if you don't do anything? Um, and then, you know, step by step, let's look at how we can make those changes. Yeah. Uh, you know, something that absolutely jumped out at me in what you just said, Victor, is the word fun, right? Uh, I, I think you know me pretty well, uh, both personally and through my posts on LinkedIn. Uh, I like to have fun. I don't want to do something if I can't have some fun doing it. Uh, I want people around me to have fun as well. And I think that is so important in business. Uh, obviously, you feel the same way. Um, you know, no one should dread getting up in the morning and going to work, whether you're the business owner, whether you're the laborer, no matter what you do. I think there's, oh, I believe there's always a way to find some fun in your day to day uh, business life. Uh, and, and I love that that you believe that as well. I, I think that's so cool. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I mean, we're going to spend most of our waking hours uh, as adults working. 
right? Like yeah. that's just, yeah. So if you can't, yeah. if you don't enjoy it, um, find something else to do. But you know, and, and I think that's part of the challenge we have in this industry. You know, we talked about there's you know three ways into it. Um, not many people chose this as their career path. It kind of chose them. Right. So okay, that being the case, we've got to deal with that reality now. How can we find you know, opportunities to make it fun and engaging. Um, and if you're technical and you love the technical side, I don't tell um, our owners to stop doing that, but you know, you've got to figure out how to work on the business, not just work in the business if you want it to move forward. Um, and it's, it's, but it's sad. I'll tell you what, what does sadden me is when I see somebody who's really not having a good time um, yeah. and you know, their business is kind of it, often the business is um, kind of um, floundering along and they're not having a good time. And it's really, you know, looking for those opportunities. And I said this to one of our owners, um, you know, what do you like to do? And he said, well, I like to sell. I said, okay, well, let's find somebody who can manage the business so you can sell. Beautiful, yeah. Um, and that, you know, we, we built a rock around that. I said, okay, like in the next 90 days, we're gonna find you a general manager. And how are we gonna do that? And broke it down. And we got it done. It took a little longer than 90 days, but he found somebody who can run the day to day of that business so he can focus on the things that he likes to do. Yeah, no, beautiful. Uh, it, it, we should have some fun, Victor, for sure. And I'm having fun right now. I think you are, too. Fantastic. Victor, um, a future guest on Bathica Banter is uh, a young lady named Joanna Wu. Uh, Joanna heads up a company called Comfort Owl, which is a subsidiary of Emco, our old friends, yours and mine at Emco. And uh, as I understand it, I'm still learning about Comfort Owl, but as I understand it, they are a financing tool, if you will, uh, for uh, contractors to offer their customers, the civilians, I call our homeowners, our customers, civilians to offer civilians financing of not only the equipment that will be installed, but on the in total, uh, installed cost. So where I'm going with this, I, I see from your website, from uh, climate care Canada's website that you guys have a financing element as well. I'm fascinated with that. Please share with us how that works. Sure. So we have a couple of different tools um, and there's, there's a funny backstory to Comfort Owl and Emco. Um, Ontario has an interesting, unique market um, because of the way um, the gas companies really own the market for many, many years in Ontario um, through rental. And, and, you know, what's fascinating is people in Ontario rent water heaters and that is like the strangest thing to people outside of Ontario. Yeah. Um, but just a weird historical kind of phenomenon that happened here. And then, and then in the early 2000s, the folks that were renting the water heaters realized that they could rent HVAC too. They could rent furnaces and air conditioners and financing just became something that was really important. So um, in, in the Ontario market, rental was a big thing for a while. Um, and I think that shifted a little bit in the last couple of years towards finance. So we at Climate Care developed something we called Clarity in 2014. And Clarity is our answer to the rental guys. Um, and we call it unrental. But the <laughs> basically what we do is we take a 12-year finance um, and bundle in breakdown protection and annual maintenance. So when we talk to consumers about what do they like about rental, they like that they make one payment and they're covered against breakdowns and, and the maintenance. Okay. Um, that, you know, it's m most consumers or civilians, as you call them, um, you know, they don't think about their HVAC until it breaks. I know it's shocking to those of us in the industry, right. you know, those of us who go down and we check the settings on our thermostats and we're looking at, you know, maybe I should slow my blower down, improve my dehumidification. Civilians aren't thinking these questions, you know, right, right. so they just want to set it and forget it. So clarity th answers that rental need that I just want to set it and forget it. Um, but what we what we discovered and the reason we set it up in the co-op was that contractors who tried to do this on their own where they they try to do a 12-year very long um, all-inclusive warranty um, and maintenance they do not typically set their accounting up properly for that mm. and so they have a huge unfunded liability <clears throat> that isn't even on their books in many cases and then when they go to sell their business they get a massive wake up and a write down because somebody says well you've been 
you know, you've been selling, you know, extended warranties. Where is that? I don't see that on your balance sheet. Where's the liability? Yeah. Where's the cash you've set aside to pay for that? And so we take that off the balance sheet of our member companies. And we, we hold that um, at the co-op and it gives homeowners the peace of mind to know that the co-op is standing behind that. Our contractors know that we're standing behind it. We are able to keep funds, you know, special labor allowance and reserve for really unusual kinds of things. So they're always whole. Um, and because we don't actually own the financing piece of it, we don't carry the paper. We, we use a finance company to do that. Sure. We don't care if they pay it off. Right. So there's no strings attached to, to clarity. They've, if they want to take their tax refund and pay off their, uh, their heat pump, all the power to them, right? We don't care. Right. And the interest is- So, so there's no penalty for early pay of, of the, okay. No, it's, and because it's not a lease. So this is where a lot of, in, in, a lot of homeowners get, um, oh, how can I say this in a politically correct way? Bamboozled um, yeah. Yeah. because they go for a lease because they like the low monthly payments, but they don't realize that um, if they want to pay it off early, they have to pay off all the interest too. Right. It's like a car lease as opposed to a loan. Yeah. 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 Whereas on the loan, you don't pay the interest until it comes due, basically. So if they right. if they pay up the loan faster, then they don't pay the interest. And sure. that's how we set up clarity. So it's better for everybody. That, that, that's brilliant. You know, uh, Victor, I'm old enough to remember when financing, at least in the United States, first came into HVAC or the concept of financing. And it was initially driven here in the States by the utility companies. And that was a huge turnoff to me back when I, in my day, I just, I just saw it as a conflict of interest. I, I, I didn't like it being driven by the utility. So it makes perfect sense to me. And I, you know, look, here's the bottom line, even an old guy like me knows this now. And it is again, the benefit of 2020. If, if you're not financing in today's world as a, as a contractor, and I'll even go beyond HVAC, uh, you're not growing, babe. <laughs> you're going to stagnate like I did. Uh, it, it, it's a huge element in growing the business. I think you agree, obviously. Oh, it's it's huge. I mean, the average ticket for uh, finance is m much higher than for cash sales. I mean, you know, if people have a line of credit and they want to use that, all the power to them. But what we find is if you don't have a financing option, you know, if you're going in there because, you know, here we are in Toronto, it's, you know, zero degrees Celsius. That's 32 for, for those of you south of the border. Um, and your furnace breaks and you need to do a replacement. You're, if you're not financing, you're going to just do the bare minimum. Um, and if you've got a 20 year old furnace and a 20 year old air conditioner and you don't offer the consumer financing, they're going to just do one when they should do both in the long run, they will be better off doing both. So I, I think that, you know, we have to be careful as an industry um, that we do what's in our customer's best interest. That is something that unfortunately does not always happen. But I'd like to say that climate care companies, you know, it's part of our culture is we really go out of our way to do what's right for our, for our customers. So when we're offering finance, it's so that they can get the proper package to solve their comfort problems in the most economical way possible. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. That's that's a good solid foundation to say the least, Victor, for sure. Hey, uh, Victor, again, doing my research uh, leading up to our interview this morning. Uh, again, I I went over the Climate Care Canada website uh, in in great detail, and I noticed, uh, much to my surprise, because I didn't know this going in, that you guys have your own brand of heat pumps, furnaces, water heaters, and water softeners. And, and if I'm correct, I believe you guys call it clarity. You also use the word clarity in your, your finance uh, element. Please share with all of us uh, a, a little bit about the clarity products, what makes them different, uh, how are they unique, and uh, yeah, please share. Yeah, sure. So so clarity, as I, as I mentioned, is about, we you know, we bundle that annual maintenance bumper to bumper warranty um, and a 12 year amortization um, together. Uh, we discovered that, that our consumers like the idea of bundling that all together to the point that they said, you know, I've got the money, I've got the cash. Yeah. Um, I just want to write you a check, but I want clarity. I want that whole bundle. And we were shocked. We were like that. It's become half of our clarity business. I, it's been kind of bizarre to us. 
um, that, but people are willing to prepay for that maintenance and breakdown protection for that peace of mind and knowing that the co-op is behind it. Um, and so it's been a big driver of our business. We're particular about the product that products that we'll put into Clarity uh, because we want to make sure that the uh, manufacturer and wholesaler we're dealing with will really have our back because we're offering that bumper to bumper protection. We're offering, you know, 12 years of maintenance. And so we want to make sure any product we bring into Clarity is a product that we're comfortable with uh, standing behind because at the end of the day, we're going to hold, be holding the bag. So sure. um, we don't offer Clarity on the entire line of products that Climate Care members sell. Um, we need to know that that these are the ones that we're going to pick and choose. So we go through that process. <clears throat> um, and, you know, with greener homes, you know, in, you know, in Canada sure. um, and, and the move to decarbonization or electrification, we had to add heat pumps um, to that mix. And so, you know, adding heat pumps and making sure we're doing it um, in a way that we're comfortable with, uh, that we can stand behind it. Because at the end of the day, uh, we want to be able to fulfill uh, the guarantee of, uh, of transparency and home comfort. I, I think it's brilliant, Victor. Uh Again, um, you've taken it to a new level. And, and what I mean by that is just like with uh, the whole concept of a cooperative going from the distributor level now to your level to contracting and, and, and same with equipment. I see many distributors with uh, private label, as we call it, um, but I don't know if I've ever seen that on the contractor level. Brilliant. Why not? Absolutely. Again, it distinguishes you from the rest of the field and that's so important to separate yourself from everything else that's out there and clarity's a great name i wish we had thought of that <laughs> hey i didn't think of it. it but you know kudos to the folks uh at climate care uh who did who came up with the concept and uh, and have brought it to fruition and it's continued to grow year after year i think you know private label as you said you know on the wholesale side is not uncommon yeah. Um, there are larger contractors that do private label. I think what makes Clarity different than just slapping, um, you know, your own label on the box is knowing that you've got the support of the co-op behind you and that, you know, if there is a problem that we're going to take care of it. Um, and so that's beneficial for the homeowner and it's beneficial for uh, the contractor member. Oh, no question. Again, I think it's brilliant. Well, I, I tell you what, Victor, uh, for a moment anyway, I want to move beyond uh, Climate Care Canada just for a few minutes. And I'd like to get your perspective on some of the bigger issues that we are facing right now in this wonderful trade of ours in HVAC. Uh, things like labor short shortages and electrification versus fossil fuels. So Let's start with labor sh shortages, because I, I, I see that being a consistent issue for now probably a good decade or more. Um, what do you think needs to be done, Victor, to entice younger people, um, young men and women, please, we need women, more women in this industry, uh, to look at HVAC as a career path? What do we need to do? That's a, that is the $64,000 question. Yeah, right. And if you're old enough to know what that refers to, then you probably saw this, you know, train coming down the tracks. I mean, I back before both of us were gray, uh, Jerry, I, <laughs> I knew, I just saw that we were going to have a labor crisis. Um, people were not getting into the trade 20 years ago. And so here we are, the boomers um, have retired, um, Gen X is was not a huge cohort and so how do we get the next generations into the trade it is it is a challenge um i think that there you know i've all <laughs> problem is hvac has not been sexy um, correct yeah right the trades have not been sexy and and i think that there's been a good push you know back in the 80s and 90s when i was in school you know it was get a four-year degree um it wasn't going yeah. to the trades people yeah. who went to the trades were kind of looked down upon so i went to university my brother went to trade school uh, my brother, my brother's income is significantly higher than mine today. Um, he was a trade. He was he he became a Red Seal certified chef, and then went into you know saw an opportunity and started this grease recovery business. Mm. Um, and he makes a lot more money than I make. I'll tell you, um, it's crazy when you have the opportunity when you can do something that other people can't do. 
um, you know, there's an opportunity there. And that's the reality we have with the trade. So I think education, it starts in elementary school and in the high schools and getting kids to really see these as good career opportunities. And to understand that being an HVAC doesn't only mean that you're going to be fixing or installing something, that there's, it's a big industry. Yes. Um, if you're in the trades, there's wholesale distribution, there's manufacturing, there's all kinds of ways that that can go, that are sales opportunities. But getting a grounding in a trade is an excellent, excellent idea and something that more kids could pursue. But we've got to, I think that the opportunity, as you said, you know, and that combination of the skilled trades and the electrification. And I think that that might be part of the opportunity here. Um, one day, a few years ago, my oldest daughter, she was in 11th grade at the time, uh, she came home and she asked me what kind of furnace we have. And I was like, oh my goodness. I, I like, my heart was like, well, so, I, you know, I was like, so happy. She was taking an interest in what I do for a living. Yeah. I said, that's great. I'm so excited. She said, no, it's for geography and we have to figure out our carbon footprint. So oh. I don't really care about the furnace, but I need to know how much carbon dioxide we're producing. I said, oh, okay, interesting. Okay. So, you know, this idea that what we do in our homes or in our cars, whatever affects our environment, I think that the younger generation is interested in those things is yeah. we've, got, we've got to talk to them where they are and they're at, you know, I'm concerned about the environment. So we can, for the first time, I think, you know, HVAC has become sexy. I think HVAC yes. became sexy with electrification and with COVID. I mean, I think that, you know, for the first time we were on the front lines of helping people um, deemed essential services, going to people's homes when um, others were stuck in their homes to ensure they had heat and they had hot water and they had air conditioning, um, filtration and indoor air quality became important for the first time in my career. And we, people for, forget what the, what the V and HVAC stands for, but yeah. ventilation suddenly yeah. became something that people were concerned about. So I think that that's part of what we have to talk about. We have to talk about, you know, how we help people in their health, indoor air quality in their health, how we help, people in the environment by leading the thrust in that in, in uh, decarbonization, electrification. And that's where I would start. If you want to, if you're a young person and you want to be involved in helping people live better lives and improving their carbon footprints, this is the industry for you. Yeah, no, no question. And, and again, um, as throughout this en entire interview, some things you said <clears throat> have jumped out at me and and one is um, the sexy aspect, right? Uh, that the, the trades was not perceived as being sexy. I think that has changed big time, Victor. And, and I think a way we can accentuate that is, I always say this to, to young people when they come to my training events, I don't know what got you here and I don't care. I'm just happy that your fanny is in the seat in front of me. And whether you know it or not, you made a brilliant decision to get into this beautiful trade because think of all your buddies who went into computers thinking that they were so smart. They were going to make a lot of money. They were going to keep their hands clean. They were going to use their mind and they were going to go into computers. A lot of those people are unemployed right now, Victor, you know that I know that. And people who are in the trade are making good money. And there's so many avenues to take within the trades, right? You can work for someone and make a fine living. How many of those computer people are ever going to own their own business? Let's just be honest. The, the chances of owning your own business in that industry is slim. In HVAC, if you got that burning in your belly to be your own boss, you can do it. You absolutely can do it. So uh, I think that is sexy, right? When you when you put it in those terms. And come on, uh, a turn on for most people is money. Uh, and and I don't think greed is bad. I, I'm I'm I guess I'm a little bit of Gordon Gecko in the, in that regard. The old Wall Street uh, again. If you know that reference, you're an old person too, right? Because, <laughs> but uh, yeah, greed is good. And don't get me wrong, excessive and anything is not good. But you know, uh, I dig money. Yeah. And and this beautiful trade of ours has given me everything that Patricia and I have. And, you know, I can, I get emotional about it. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, well, 
we're not, my, we're not, I like to say we're not rapacious capitalists uh, at Climate Care. Uh, that's part of being in a co-op, right? Is yeah. that we are interested in the results are important, but they're not the only thing, the financial results, I mean. Um, right. But yeah, we want to make sure that I don't, I don't um, equivocate. I mean, we want to help our members make more money. We want to help them right. have fun and make more money so that they can do the things that they want to do. I don't right. think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's great. And they can hire people and they can expand their businesses and they can do great things. So money is important. That's the world we live in. That's how it works. Uh, yeah. And and uh, yeah, you can if you're if you're a tradesperson and you have an entrepreneurial bug, then you can actually you go out on your own, start your own business, join with somebody else. Absolutely. The sky's the limit. And, you know, and another issue uh, that I brought up uh, in my question to you was uh the need for more women to get into our trade, Victor, right? Um, and a, a future guest is going to be a young lady named uh, Jessica Bannister. Most of us in the trade know her as HVAC Jess. She's, uh, I call her, I consider her an influencer in our industry. Young lady who's so excited about our industry and uh, puts that out there on social media. She's a brilliant social media person. And uh, yeah, so uh, again, we, we need to bring everybody into our trade because there are, first of all, there's need and there's so many opportunities. You know, Victor, if I may take a moment for a little uh, shameless self-promotion, I, I write articles, often they get published most recently in the HPAC magazine up in Canada. And the most recent article spoke to some uh, challenges that I had in the HVAC uh, with health, right? That, that people never told us about possible issues that could be problematic when, when I was a kid starting in the business. And anyway, my, my point is this. I got a wonderful letter yesterday emailed to me from the mother of a high school student who read this article, who read my article. And she was asking me, all the questions that you and I just kind of answered uh, in, in the last question there as to, you know, what are the benefits of a career in HVAC? What can be done? What, what is available? What are the financial benefits? And I was just so thrilled. I mean, that's why I write, right? If you can get through to one person like that, it, it makes it, it's a beautiful thing. So I'm, I'm looking forward to answering that, that mom uh, later today, but uh, yeah, it's, it's all good. Hey, so, the next part of that question, uh, Victor, was uh, electrification, decarbonization, uh, words that didn't exist <laughs> in our vernacular not but five, ten years ago, right? Uh, this, this movement uh, away from fossil fuels to electric. Um, how, how do you fall on that issue, both politically and, and the practical aspect sure. of it? So it's it's uh, so I was involved with National Resources Canada. I was asked by HRAI to join um, what was called the Market Transformation Roadmap to Decarbonize the Building Sector Space Heating Experts Team, um, and I co-chaired. I was the industry co-chair for that back in 2020, 2021, um, and it was a very interesting process, really looking at how are we going to decarbonize the building sector. The building sector, of course, produces a huge, huge amount of um, the CO2, CO2 emissions in Canada. We're a, a heating bias country. You know, it's cold up here. We need to heat. Yeah. And so how do we figure out how to reduce the amount of carbon emissions for space heating? Um, and it's contentious in our industry. I mean, I think that it does break down along, you know, typically breaks down along liberal conservative kinds of lines. Um, our industry tends to be more conservative. Um, and so there was initially a lot of resistance. Uh, but I think that we can't bury our heads in the sand. I mean, I'm not an expert in climate change. I don't pretend to be an expert in climate change. I, um, my bias is that when a, the vast majority of experts tell me to pay attention to something, I, I follow the majority. Because I just, I don't have the, I'm not equipped to, to become a climatologist and dissect what they're all talking about. So I have to rely on, on what the experts are saying. The experts are saying there's a problem. The experts are saying that we're contributing to it. Um, 
And so I think as an industry, we have to respond to that. I think our customers also are hearing that message and they want to respond to it. So I kind of, I break up our, our market into a couple of different ways. There are folks that are um, committed to uh, climate change and stopping it from happening. They're willing to make major personal investments and sacrifices to decarbonize or electrify their homes. Um, then there's the squishy middle that, you know, will do something if it doesn't cost them any money. And then there are the folks who just don't give a damn, right? right. I'm not as a, you know, I think Michael Jordan famously said, you know, he was asked why he doesn't become more political. And he said, because Republicans wear running shoes too. And so, you know, I, I think as a, a heating contractor, it's not our business to tell the consumer um, what to do. It's right. We are here to answer the need of how do I heat and cool my home? Um, how do I improve my indoor air quality? And I think that we have to provide our consumers with solutions that help them electrify or decarbonize. I just think that that's the way the market is. Um, the auto industry, I think, also has been struggling with this. Mm -hmm. uh, but in our industry, it's not that hard. We've been doing electrification for a long time in rural areas. If your choice has been heating with, um, with uh, home heating oil or propane, you've been using a heat pump. There's a good chance you can, or you went geothermal. And so our members that are outside of, you know, natural gas service areas have been doing heat pumps for a long time. Um, the economic argument was just so strong. In in Canada, where we have a price on, on carbon now, also known as the carbon tax, yeah. um, you know, it's just, it, it, at this point, if you've got a heat pump, an air source heat pump that runs at a seasonal COP of 2.5, it's cheaper to heat with a heat pump than heat with, uh, a gas furnace, a 95% gas furnace. So my argument to our members, I, I mean, I was obviously involved with, with National Resources Canada on this, but my message to my members has been, you've got to offer a heat pump every time because whether that's a all electric system or a hybrid, right? but if you're offering somebody a gas furnace and an air conditioner in the next five years, they're going to come back to you and say, why did you do this? Why did right. you sell me this? You should have sold me a heat pump. And in fact, we've had that starting to happen already for, for people that have bought air conditioners five, five years ago. And they've got a perfectly fine working air conditioner. And they're saying, how do I decarbonize? Well, you're going to have to replace your air conditioner. So right. I want right. to get ahead of that curve. Right. You know, um, you mentioned hybrid. And uh, working as much as I do now in Canada, that's something that I have been turned on to from your market and you guys call it dual fuel up there, right? Where you take a heat pump, uh, you take an A coil and put it atop of a, in some cases, an existing uh, uh, gas fired furnace. And you have the best, best of both worlds, right? Whatever is cheaper in that moment in time to, to burn, that's what you burn. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah, and I, I do see that coming south now. I do see that uh, moving into the States as well as an option. I, I, I think dual fuel is brilliant. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely um, the answer for today. And I, I think it's a bridge technology. I think in, in 10 years, in areas where the electric grid can support pure electrification, we'll go all electric. I, don't, I think the efficiency of cold climate air source heat pumps is just coming up so fast. Yeah. And you know. And we've answered so many of the issues that we've had traditionally. They blow cold air. Well, not anymore. They don't blow cold air anymore. You know, and we were dealing, you know, we're better adept at dealing with defrost issues. Um, and we're using electric reheat, you know, for dehumidification now in, in systems. So I think that in, you know, in 10 years, we'll be doing the most, in most cases, we'll be doing all electric systems. But I think right now, just like in the auto industry, hybrids are kind of where things are at right now. Right. Whether that be a plug-in hybrid or a non-plug-in hybrid, but that's where the industry, how the car industry is moving. I think that's where the HVAC industry is moving to. Yeah, I, I agree for sure, Victor. Well, Victor, uh, I want to switch gears with you for a moment, if you don't mind. Uh, you and I are very active on LinkedIn. In fact, I think that's really where we first met was through LinkedIn. And of course, we've met personally now uh, a number of times uh, in different situations, but um. I also see that you, like me, uh, go beyond 
using LinkedIn just for our business and professional career. Uh, we often speak of our personal lives and issues that are important to us. And in my particular case, that's my sobriety, um, my concern for mental health issues and people not paying attention to mental health issues. And, and for you of late, I notice um, a, a, a personal subject for you is the conflict between Hamas and, and Israel. So here's where I'm going with this, Victor. Um, our detractors, and we have detractors, let's be honest, uh, say that this is not a, a subject. These, these are not subjects for, for LinkedIn. Uh, these are subjects that we should keep to ourselves. These are opinions that we should keep to ourselves. So my, my question to you is this, how do you answer that? How do you feel about that? Uh, uh, how do you answer the detractor that says uh, this, there's no place for that on, on LinkedIn, please. Wow, Jerry. Um, Loaded question, I know. Well, it's 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 a very difficult question, and yeah. I really struggled with it myself. Um, yeah, you know, if you go back through my LinkedIn posts, um, I really never spoke of anything personal on LinkedIn until October seventh. Right. Um, I was very much of the mindset that that you know LinkedIn was a pure channel for business communications, and my personal stuff I did on on um, uh, Facebook. And right. my, um, you know, some broader industry things I did on Twitter, but I really worked hard to keep LinkedIn a pure business conversation. Yeah. Um, and then I woke up. Well, I, I, I mean, this story it was a crazy story. I mean, I was down in Baltimore. My, we, we, my wife, my wife's family's in the states. They're American. Um, I was down in Baltimore for. Uh, uh, Jewish holiday known as uh, Simchas Torah. And um, that that's a two-day holiday. So it was Saturday and Sunday. And um, Sunday morning, I went to synagogue. And the rabbi said, you know, this is the, this is the happiest day of the Jewish year. Mm. Um, it, is the, it is the happiest day of the Jewish year. And we came into the synagogue and the rabbi said, listen, we don't know exactly what's going on because as an orthodox jew we don't uh, use computers or cell phones or anything on on our sabbath or holidays um, but he said we don't know exactly what's going on but there's been an attack in israel mm. and we said some additional prayers um when you know synagogue service ended um went back and that night sunday night i turned on my computer my cell phone to discover that my son who's learning in uh, a yeshiva rabbinic seminary in jerusalem had been living in a war zone for mm -hmm. the preceding 48 hours mm -hmm. um and it was a shocking i've never felt terror like that jerry now i i spent two years in israel uh, just before the second intifada started um, I'm, I myself had been used to, you know, walking down the street and looking out for suspicious objects, mm. um, you know, and bags left unattended. Um, I, I've seen bomb squads on the street. Like I, but my son was now mm. in an active war zone. Yeah. So I, I was just blown away, uh, figuratively speaking. Um, mm. and I had to drive home from Baltimore to Toronto, which was a nine hour drive. And listening to the news um it was a tr tr unbelievably triggering experience for me yeah. and my family and i think for many many jews in north america what was most shocking was that when i got home there were protests you know in new york and in toronto in support of hamas yes and and i was blown away and I was a little stunned and I got some, I did get some flack for this. I was a little stunned that I, you know, not many of my um, non-Jewish friends and colleagues reached out to say anything. Mm -hmm. And I, I think for most people, I'm the most obviously Jewish person they know. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> so, so, so it was a little bit like a little shocking. So I, I posted a post uh, that was definitely contentious um, and, and offended some people. Um, and it ended up being my most viral liked post ever on LinkedIn. Of course. Um, and I got many, many, many friends who reached out to me after to say, I'm sorry. I just, I, we don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I would, right. we, of course we support you, support your family, feel, you know, people offering to help fly my son home mm. from Israel. Mm. Um, it, it was, it was a tremendous outreach. So I, I really did struggle with that, with posting that post and the subsequent posts. I, the reason I continued, um, was because I think that <sighs> Jews in North America make up a tiny percentage of the population. Uh, you know, in Canada, we're less than 1% of the population. In, in the United States, we're less than 2% of the population. Um, and many people, most people just, you know, that's not their battle over there. They don't know what's going right. on. Right. And so I, I just... I really felt this is something that you need to know we're going through. You know, we're, you know, the people you know, the Jewish people you know, whether they look like me or they don't, we're not okay. This is something we're really struggling with. It took me weeks to get back to where I was. Um, you know, the, it, it was just overwhelming and consuming. Sure. Um, and mental, you know, my mental health was severely impaired for that first month. Um and I actually for the, I actually put a limit on my Twitter, uh, a one hour per day limit because I'm like I just, yeah, I'm gonna destroy myself if I yeah if I yeah sure. Um, but it, you know, so I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish I could have kept LinkedIn pure and clean and just business. But um, it's the platform that I have the most reach on, um, and the broadest reach. It's not just people who I know personally is people I know professionally and people who I, you know, have never met in person, but who, who, right. who I've got a connection with. So I just felt I had to share what was going on and how it affects me and my community. I, I didn't know that, that your son was there, uh, Victor. So thank you for uh, sharing that. Mm. Um, you know, m my feelings uh, about it, Victor has always been this way. Uh, if you don't like what I'm writing about, stop reading it and move on. Um, you know, that's the beauty of LinkedIn and, and social media in general, if, and, and, and media in general, right? If you don't like the message, change the channel. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. What I don't like from a personal level is when I go to be entertained, when I pay hundreds of dollars for a concert ticket and the artist starts spewing their political views, whether I agree with those views or not, it's not what I came for. I came to be entertained and I don't like that. Uh, but I think what you and I have done and do on LinkedIn, again, uh, if you don't like it, change the channel, babe. It's, it's Exactly. I mean, I guess you could say you get what you pay for. You didn't pay me for my <laughs> – <laughs> <laughs> you can keep scrolling. There's nothing – you can unfollow me. Those are all exactly. options. Not, exactly. It, you're not, it's not Lock a captive audience. Me. I think your point exactly. You know, if you're paying it to, to for a seat, you're a captive audience. And unless you're going to hear somebody who you know is is – going to be political and that's right. like that's part of their persona then i i completely agree with you just just shut up and sing right <laughs> exactly yeah very good well victor uh we've come just about to the end of our time together but i want to give you one last opportunity and uh when this goes to air you'll see that at the end of every episode I uh, do something that I call Jerry's Pick of the Month. And it's just an opportunity for me to share with our audience something that I have discovered over the last 30 days, whether it be a book, a film, an article, a subject, whatever it may, a tool, whatever it may be that really turned me on, that I thought had in incredible value and I want to share it with our audience. So I want to start doing, uh, giving that same opportunity to our guests. So to that end, Victor, uh, do you have anything that you have discovered recently that you'd like to share with our audience, please? 
Well, I think I, I mentioned it already in passing, um, and that is the book Traction by Gino Wickman. Um, and the principles that he outlines that have become the entrepreneurial operating system EOS. You know, we've been doing it at Climate Care for about a year now. We've seen tremendous results. And I would really, you know, for the price of a hard copy book, or I'm yeah. sure they have it in paperback, uh, you can really start to learn those principles. And what I would really encourage people to do is um, there's all kinds of free tools that they've made. It's kind of interesting because EOS is a for-profit business, but there's all kinds of free tools that they've made available on their website. Um, and I would just encourage if you're a, a contractor who's really struggling with figuring out how to have more fun and make more money, um, pick up traction. And uh, there's also another book called What the Heck is EOS? Um, I'm not a paid shill for, for Gina Wickman. I don't get royalties on his book sales. But I'll tell you, it is, it's worth its weight in gold, man. Um, if you're struggling in your business and you're trying to figure out what to do, just read the first two chapters of EOS. And then you can reach out on, on LinkedIn or, or uh, DM me on Twitter. I'm happy to have a conversation about how to implement it. And, and again, Victor, the author is Gino Whitman. Do I have that right? Wickman, W-I-C-K-M-A-N. Gotcha, because I'm going to check that out myself. Well, Victor, I cannot thank you enough for this. You know, I've been so looking forward for some time now to have you as a guest because I knew that you would knock it out of the park. And this exceeded my expectations. Just an incredible conversation. Uh, you're a wonderful friend. I love you, my friend. Uh, thank you for being who you are. And uh, yeah, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, thanks so much, Victor. You're the best. Thank you so much, Jerry. Such a pleasure. And I'm so pleased and I feel so fortunate to be your first guest on, on this new version of your show. Thank you so much. Now time for Jerry's pick of the month. And my pick of the month is going to be Instagram. Now, before you jump all over me, I'm not suggesting I've just discovered Instagram. I'm old, but I'm not that old. I know what Instagram is. Uh, but it is my new handle on Instagram, which is Toso Bathica Jerry. And this is my sole purpose for going on Instagram, people. It is to promote our customers, Bathica's customers, Toso installs, whether they be mini split or our Apex product, our ducted system. I want you to send me pictures of your jobs, a brief description, just the equipment used, any unique uh, challenges that you faced, um, and I will promote your company, your project through our Instagram account, again, which is Toso Bathica Jerry. So please, please, this is for you. This is for our audience. This is for our customers of Bathica. Please send me your pictures and we will promote your project giving you all the credit so start sending me your information your pictures to jerry wagner at bathica.com hey uh so happy to get uh bathica banter episode no number one in the can so to speak and looking forward to next month with episode number two and uh you're gonna love that one too stay tuned